Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our YouTube Live, uh, the Atlas Experiment. Um, my name is Darren Price. I'm a particle physicist at Atlas, and I'll be your host for tonight. Um, before we begin, I'd like to remind you that we really do encourage you to ask questions, both in the chat uh, here on YouTube and uh, elsewhere on social media. Um, because there will be a question and answer session at the end, so please put in your questions that uh, you, you would like answered or that come up during the talk. Uh, so today we have the ninth talk in our series, um, and this will be on exploring electroweak phenomena at the Atlas experiment. Uh, our speaker today will be Dr. Carolos Potamianos, uh, who's an Ernest Rutherford Fellow at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. Uh, Carolos joined Atlas in 2012, and his current research focuses on measuring rare standard model processes uh, involving the interactions of multiple bosons uh, through a process known as vector boson scattering. Uh, Carolos is also an expert on silicon detectors and is working on a new all silicon inner detector tracker uh, for the Atlas experiments high luminosity upgrade and on research and development for future experiments. Uh, so, to begin the talk, uh, I'll hand over to you, Carlos. Thank you very much, uh, Danner, Darren. Um, good uh, evening, everyone, or afternoon or uh, morning, depending on where you are um, in this world, because we're at the end all online. Um, so I would like to, to welcome you tonight to this uh, evening where we will discuss uh, the implication of symmetry in nature, and in particular, we will be focusing on how electroweak phenomena can be explored in uh, the ATLAS experiment. Um, so uh, as I will uh, start, I would like to start by a little consideration regarding symmetry. So symmetry is something we all observe around us, we all appreciate, uh, mostly in art, uh, for example, here in architecture, like you see here, uh, the ceiling of the Palau de la Musica Catalana, in uh, Barcelona, which you see is a very highly beautiful and symmetric structure. Uh, it's not the only structure, of course, we, we have symmetry. I've just take another example. If not, I could talk here for hours with this. This is a tessellation uh, from uh, Marrakesh, where you see these tiles, which are made of many geometrical pieces, which actually together are placed in a certain way as to exhibit symmetry and, and especially look uh, beautiful to, to many of us. But uh, before we go delve in the, in the topic uh, further with physics, let's a bit discuss uh, what we mean by symmetry. So here you have a representation of a snowflake. Uh, it's very much zoomed in and you observe already that there are some, what naively one would call symmetry. Uh, and indeed, uh, if you were, for example, to rotate that uh, snowflake by 60 degrees, you would obtain something which looks awfully similar to the first object. And in fact, this means that some changes actually don't seem to change anything. Um, you may think I just take the same picture, but I can show you that these images were indeed rotated. Now, the ancients already studied symmetry to a very, very deep level. For example, here you see in front of you, uh, the, the famous um, uh, Plato solids, uh, basically where you have some solids exhibiting some symmetry. Uh, the word symmetry actually also comes from Greek, which is symmetria of same measure. And um, all these symmetries and the symmetrical shapes, you could rotate and move around and they would actually appear and change, uh, were early on mapped uh, to the elements that were known back in the day, uh, such as fire, such as earth, such as the air and water. And all this was encompassed in uh, this universe. And all these polyhedrons were actually uh, responsible for encompassing symmetry. Of course, today uh, we know a lot more about matter. We, we, we know how macroscopic objects look like, what they're made of, uh, basically from the bulk of the material, the crystals that might be inside them and how these crystals are made out of atoms, atoms themselves made of electrons orbiting around an atomic nucleus. Uh, since quite a few years, we already know that the nucleus is in fact not a, a static object, but made of uh, protons and neutrons. And since about 50 years, we already know a bit more that uh, the nucleon is actually made of 
other particles within it, which we today call quarks. Uh, together, electrons and quarks make up the matter around us. While you might know that fact, maybe if you're following a bit physics, what you might not know is that these comments, uh, components are actually governed by symmetry. And this is what we will explore today. So first of all, let me briefly embark on the explanation of the forces which act up on the particles, uh, which we just presented. First, there's gravity. You know gravity because you experience it, you feel it every day. Um, this is what pulls us on the earth. Uh, this is also what makes earth rotate around the sun and, and things like that. Uh, another force you're probably very familiar with is electromagnetism. Electromagnetism explains why your magnet sticks on your fridge or why your electrical appliances work. It also is what allows us to communicate. Electromagnetism is actually the visible light, so it's how I can see you and you can see me and we can actually communicate. But it's also the radio waves that we use, for example, when we have um, uh, cellular connections or if we use the radio. So um, electromagnetism is also more than that. It actually enables the chemical bonds and the chemical reactions that we all uh, know sustain life. And it's also responsible for um, uh, ensuring that I don't fall through my chair. Forces that you might be less familiar um, with are the nuclear forces. Um, unless, of course, you're a physicist or a nuclear engineer, and, and there you're probably very familiar. Um, first, we have the weak nuclear force. And the weak nuclear force is actually fundamental because it's what enables nuclear reactions, which are actually what gives us most of the energy, namely through the sun. So nuclear fusion and nuclear fission uh, actually happen through the weak force. Uh, then, last but not least, is the strong version of the nuclear force, which is actually responsible for ensuring that uh, atomic nuclei are indeed remaining as nuclei. Indeed, imagine two protons that are put together, and because of the electromagnetic force, they would actually normally repel each other. But the strong nuclear force is actually much stronger so that it can enable the protons to stick together and actually form a nuclear, a nucleus, um, and allow atoms to exist and allow all matter to exist. All these forces are actually in their own way fundamental and allow us to um, have interactions in our world. Now, before I go on and explain all these pieces, I want to go back a bit more in what symmetry means for physicists. So uh, let's imagine that you're in outer space sitting in vacuum. Uh, while it might be boring, it would actually allow you to do a few experiments, which will understand, help you understand what a symmetry is from a viewpoint of a physicist. To a physicist, symmetry means you can rearrange characteristics of a physical system and get the same answer to any physical question you may ask. So imagine that we're in space, like I said, and in fact, um, you are looking around you and you cannot tell anything apart. There is nothing there. So any direction looks like any other. And in fact, if were you to, to rotate and look around, you would actually see that nothing changes. In fact, you wouldn't even able to tell you're rotating. This is because uh, empty space is symmetric in all directions. There is nothing else. You can also have the same if you actually move in a constant velocity in space everything also again looks the same. It's empty and you really have a perfect symmetry. So if you were to do any experiment at any place in space, you would actually expect to see the same result. This is what actually Einstein postulated saying that the laws of physics are independent of one's reference frame. He first started with studying cases where the um, person's reference frame was moving at a constant velocity. We call this an inertial uh, frame. And this led to what we know today as special relativity, and in particular to the equivalence between mass and energy, the famous E equals mc squared formula. But he didn't stop there. He also studied what would happen when we have uh, um, accelerating um, bodies and, and the reference frame is accelerating. This leads to the general theory of relativity, which is uh, much more complex. But the main learning from that theory is that acceleration and gravity are equivalent. And in fact, gravity is acceleration due to space-time curvature. Most of you know that Einstein received the Nobel Prize, but 
it wasn't for this groundbreaking discovery. Einstein was in fact uh, honored for something else completely, a photoelectric effect. Um, and he was also honored for general contributions to theoretical physics. While you might think that this groundbreaking discovery of relativity was actually something that he um, would get the Nobel for in the groundbreaking contributions to theoretical physics, actually the Nobel committee explicitly wrote him a letter saying that the Nobel Prize would not take into account the value that would be accorded to your relative theory of relativity and gravitational theory uh, after these are confirmed in the future. So actually Einstein could have gotten probably a second Nobel Prize, but that part never came through. Yet these theories are fundamental. Now, while Einstein was studying general relativity, a brilliant mathematician, Amy Noether, actually showed that the things in nature uh, that we have around us actually are a manifestation of underlying symmetries. She actually proved that invariant features of, of our equations, such as symmetry under rotation, symmetry under space translation, or time translation, was actually leading to some conservation law. For example, a symmetry of rotation implies that the angular momentum is conserved. And actually these days you can see a lot of very nice applications of angular momentum conservation. If you look, for example, at figure skating at the Winter Olympics, you will see that the figure skaters make some beautiful moves. And this is mostly through the conservations of angular momentum that they can do all these beautiful spins. Um, another interesting um, symmetry, which is time translation, which means simply that an experiment carried now today can actually be again carried tomorrow and give the same result, effectively also means the conservation of energy. Um, so while symmetry has fascinated the philosophers through time and mathematicians, it was really Emily Noether's um, discovery that actually had profound symmetry and profound implications in nature that was actually essential and was not very well understood at the time, even when she died quite a young, at a young age of 53. But since then, the fact that conservation laws and symmetries are interchangeable and one means the other is actually a guiding principle of modern physics. Another person that played a big role in physics uh, was Paul Dirac, who actually uh, wondered what would happen if one combines a theory of relativity, of special relativity that I just explained to you from Einstein, and quantum mechanics, which was the leading theory at the time to explain the uh, motion of electrons. And he said, okay, what if we combine the two together? Actually, what he came up with was some equations uh, which appear to have two solutions, a bit like a second order polynomial has two, two solutions. Uh, parabola basically intersects the line in two points, these two solutions. Uh, so what Dirac uh, noticed is that one of the solution corresponded to the electron, a particle that was already known at the time. But he was intrigued and wondering what the second uh, solution was. And what he had to come to the conclusion with is that the second solution was in fact an electron with a negative energy. That sounded of course bizarre because energy is not meant to be negative, uh, but this was the interpretation he made. And, and in trying to, to, to try to grasp this, he actually postulated that basically there should be an anti-electron somewhere existing. And he even, even went further to say that every particle we observe is actually also accompanied by an antiparticle. Of course, he was very puzzled because, uh, you know, we're made out of matter. There is no particular antimatter. And, and he figured in his model that if you had antimatter meet matter, there would be annihilation and the production of, of pure energy. Or if you had energy that was capable of uh, taking away uh, an electron from the vacuum, that electron being taken away, which you see in this picture, would mean that a hole would be left where the electron was. And that hole would actually correspond to the anti-electron. So energy would be able to extract an electron from the vacuum and that, vac that electron would be there and the hole that was left open would be the antiparticle. So he also said, oh, what's going on now in the universe? Because we have a lot of matter around us, but no antimatter. But he thought that at the time there might be places in the universe where antimatter was dominant 
but because these places were far away and we only could see light, we would not be able to see that they're actually made of antimatter. That was at least the belief at the time. But more importantly, the anti-electron was actually discovered in 1932 by Anderson, uh, and um, he identified a positively charged particle with a mass equal to that of the electron. He was also making sure that this could not have been a proton uh, by just confirming that the trajectory you see here in the picture of this bubble chamber is not compatible with that of the proton. Uh, both Dirac and Anderson received Nobel Prizes for their groundbreaking discoveries. Fast forward today, and a few Nobel Prizes later, where I will not go in, in further detail, we have the standard model of particle physics, which is uh, basically explaining all the visible matter around us. So let us quickly go through the current state of the knowledge. Um, so we have already seen that protons are made of quarks and that together uh, with the electrons, they form the atoms. And these in our picture here are the up and down quark and the electron. But what we didn't discuss yet is that there is a particle called the neutrino. And this neutrino is actually a particle that arises uh, from the weak interaction. So interacts with a weak interaction. And so all these together form up a family. And this is most of the matter around us is actually made of that. And the nuclear interactions that we see are actually uh, happening because of these uh, particles. However, for some peculiar reasons that will maybe become apparent later, nature dotted us of two other families of quarks and leptons, which are actually exhibiting the same properties of the, same, of the first family, except for the mass. Uh, in addition, we have the fundamental forces, which you already described. And this is how the particles interact. So first we have the photon, which is the particle through which electromagnetic interaction happens. Then we have the W and Z boson, which are two particles that explain how the weak interaction happens. And then we have the strong nuclear force, which is mediated through what we call the gluon. Then we have a last particle, which the purpose will become much clearer sooner, which is the infamous Higgs boson. So all these particles interact together and the picture on the right gives you a bit of an idea of how things interact between each other. Now, what I want you to take away is three things, that the quarks actually are feeling all the four in main interaction, fundamental interactions, that the weak force acts on all the components of matter, both quarks and leptons, and also that the neutrinos are actually only affected by the weak force. They do not act, interact with any of the other forces. One thing that I left out of this picture is the existence of antimatter. So basically, these pictures actually just double some of the particles because for each particle, there is a corresponding antiparticle, provided that the particle has a charge. When it doesn't, it's often the case that the particle is its own antiparticle. Now, I simplified things a little bit. In reality, things are a bit more complicated uh, because the strong interaction actually carries what we call a color charge, which is typically represented by the colors red, green, and blue. And so actually this brings the number of particles to a much larger number. So in fact, while we have 17 distinct kinds of particles with all the symmetry considerations, this brings us to 48 fermions and uh, 13 bosons. Now, what is very good and beautiful about the standard models is that we have three symmetries to explain actually the visible matter. So what I sh showed you about the standard model earlier can actually be beautifully summarized and a mathematician or a physicist will appreciate that beauty and I, you will have to trust me for it, but I will try to get, get you a bit of an essence is that there are some symmetrical transformations in mathematics that can actually be used to explain these forces except for the gravity. So the strong force or quantum chromodynamics or QCD in short is actually governed by something called the SU3 symmetry. And what's interesting is that this symmetry has actually eight so-called generators, which are actually that minimum set of things you need to be able to generate all the aspects of that symmetry. And this is why in nature, we in fact have eight gluons because the generators of the SU3 group are actually eight. 
Now, similarly, for the weak and electromagnetic forces, we have the SU2 and the U1 symmetry, and each of them respectively has three generators for SU2 and one generator for U1, and together these form the W, two W bosons because they're charged, the W plus and W minus, the Z boson and the photon. So this is an important aspect is that the number of bosons is equal to the number of generators of the symmetry group. Now, keep in mind that this doesn't explain why we have three quark families. It just explains why we have those interactions between the particles. Now, while we are going here, before moving forward, I want to exhibit also some other particles that we have in the standard, um, the symmetry that we have in the standard model. So the symmetries of standard model include, for example, the charge symmetry. So this simply means that for every positively charged object, you replace it with a negatively charged object and vice versa. Or you have a parity transformation, which basically changes the origins of the coordinate system. So for x, y, and z, you replace by minus x, minus y, and minus c. And the specificity of this uh, symmetry is actually that it's a bit similar, though the parallel is not, not the greatest, but it gives an idea, is that it would convert your left hand as you look yourself in the mirror into your right hand. And that's why this, this symmetry is also called chiral from keri, kiras in ancient Greek, which is basically this aspect of symmetry of your hand. And in fact, we often talk about right-handedness or left-handedness uh, in those terms. Then you also have time symmetry. So basically this means you just change the direction of the arrow of time and you see how the physical systems might interact. Now, another symmetry that you can consider is actually the combination of those symmetries together. For example, taking charge and parity together, and at that time you will change both the charge, but also what we have, for example, as the uh, spin of a particle. So uh, uh, the way the particle, the handedness, I should say, of the particle. And this is, for example, how you convert matter to antimatter and vice versa. Another theory that's very fundamental is actually the combination of the three, which is called CPT theory. And actually for very fundamental deep reasons, this symmetry is never violated in systems that respect the uh, special relativity. And this is the standard model because the standard model is embedded in special relativity. So while these are some symmetries that I try to give you an idea, uh, Laura gave a, a, a nice overview in this channel about uh, these symmetries, so you can uh, watch that video if, if you want. Um, and I just want to go over two other numbers that are important, uh, symmetry conservations and, and conserved quantities of the standard model interactions of most of them is the baryon number. So the fact that when you create a baryon, a baryon is, is uh, something that's made up of, of, of quarks. When you create a baryon, uh, you need to create an equivalent amount of antibaryons. And similar with leptons, when you create a lepton, you actually need to create uh, a, a same amount of, of antileptons. And so these are the symmetries under which our, our particles operate. Now, while beautiful and explaining many, many things, actually the standard model doesn't explain it all. Of course, it does incorporate gravity. We already said that, but even so, and we know that there are some problems because when looking at the universe, and especially, for example, looking at the rotation of galaxies, we notice that the speed of rotation of the stars as we go farther away from the center of the galaxy is actually not matching what we would expect if we were to account the mass of the stars that we actually observe. So if we expect the, the use the visible disk, we would expect that the, the velocity is actually man, uh, shown by this dotted curve. While what we observe in reality is this other curve where actually, uh, as you go farther and farther away of the uh, center of the galaxy, you don't actually go, go slower. So uh, to, to, to try to explain this, uh, scientists had to come up with an idea that there is something that interacts with gravity because this this is what drives the, the motions of these galaxies. But you had a problem that that matter was not visible. That's why we called it dark. And uh, matter actually on, is only 5% of the matter and energy content of the universe. And this dark matter, which we don't quite know what it is, is about 27%. But another big chunk that's missing, that's about 68%, is actually what we call 
dark energy, for a lack of a better name. And this is what we don't know almost anything about. And this is used to understand and explain why and how the universe started expanding in an accelerated fashion at some point during its history. So I just show you a couple of things that the standard model doesn't explain. There are in fact many more, such as for example, the mass of neutrinos, which we know should be massive while in the standard model, they are not. But unfortunately, I don't have much time to go about that. So um, I would like now to go back to, 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 to the symmetries. And I actually want to talk to you about a nice experiment performed in 1956 um, by Madame uh, Chen Xiong Wu, who actually, um, it was one of the most groundbreaking experiments, I think, in the, in the last, um, um, you know, certainly 50 or even more 100 years, which actually um, showed that nature is actually not, uh, that, 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 that the weak force, uh, the radioactive decay, is actually not conserving the transformation of parity, one of the symmetries that I explained to you before. So uh, what uh, Maramu did actually is take atoms of cobalt and she tried to understand, um, so an, a, a radio, a atom, a cobalt is a radioactive atom, which actually emits electrons through what we call beta decay. And the fact is that uh, she wanted to understand whether the direction of emissions of those electrons was actually equivalent through all directions in space or had uh, some asymmetry. So um, the reason why this is important is that if the um, decay of the electrons had some asymmetry, it would mean that if you perform a parity transformation, um, you would be able to tell the difference between this world and the parity transformed world. And so she went on to create her experiment. So she used cobalt atoms. Um, she actually used the magnetic field to try to align what we call the spin of those cobalt atoms, which is an intrinsic property of those atoms so that they're all in the same state and kind of in the same phase, if you will. And then she looked at how the electrons are decaying. And what she observed is that the direction of decay of these electrons was predominantly in the opposite direction of that of the spin of the particle, uh, of, the, of the cobalt atom. And so this was fundamental because this meant that if you were to carry the experiment to the, the parity symmetric world, you would actually be able to distinguish what's the correct experiment and what's not. And in fact, you could distinguish left from right. So, this meant that nature actually makes a difference between left and right. And this is fundamental because actually up to that point, we actually did not know if weak interactions did exhibit um, 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 symmetry under parity. So the universe is therefore fundamentally what we say left-handed, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But what it also tells us is that it's possible if you want to communicate, assuming you meet and, and you know that there is an extraterrestrial intelligence species with whom you can exchange information and talk, if you will, or, or communicate, but you do not see anything in common. Uh, for a long while, it was believed that it was impossible to tell them left from right and tell them this is left, this is right without seeing each other because there, we have nothing as a point of comparison to say, oh, this is what we call left and this is what we call right. It's a matter of convention. I could call everything you call left right and vice versa, and the physics would look the same. But it turns out that under parity, that is not the case. And this is really, really fundamental in physics. The two theorists who actually uh, predicted um, that asked, suggested to make this experiment in order to, to, to understand uh, the the, the parity violation in the weak uh, force actually received the Nobel Prize, but unfortunately, Madame Wu was not among the recipients. This is considered one of the biggest blunders of the Nobel Committee. There are probably more, but this is one of the most fundamental because uh, Li and Yang, the two theorists, would not have been able to make that experiment. They were theorists, and you needed someone with whose expertise to actually make that experiment. And in fact, even Wu herself had to get the best cryo. Uh, scientists available at their time to actually manage to create the environment for successfully making this experiment, because this requires to be almost at a zero absolute temperature, so about minus 273 degrees Celsius, because you cannot afford to have any motion of thermal motion to affect the outcome of this result. Now, I know I spend a lot of time on this, 
but there was a meager consolation for Madame Wu because she won the first Wolf Prize in physics in 1978. So in the standard model, what the Wu experiment just showed is that the weak force only operates between left-handed quarks and right-handed anti-quarks. So the weak interaction does not interact on right-handed quarks. So this is fundamental because this means that there is a preference in the universe towards left, and that's why we call this symmetry SU2 left. Now, what this also gives you a hint is that while we discuss this for quarks, the situation is very similar for leptons. And in fact, you know that uh, basically right-handed neutrinos are something that in principle uh, are not going to interact with the weak force. But because neutrinos only interact with the weak force, this means that if the neutrinos are massive and the right-handed neutrino does not interact with anything else but therefore gravity, this could be a candidate for dark matter. Of course, we need more investigations about that, and there are many theories predicting some things, but this could be an idea for dark matter. Now, uh, after a few years um, after Hu's experiment, another fundamental symmetry was understood to be broken uh, by the uh, weak interaction. This is what we call CP, so it's the conjugation of charge and parity together. And this is fundamental too, because after it was observed that CP was also violated, this had huge implications in the physics because in order to explain this violation of charge parity, the only way that this could be done was to consider that there were three families of quarks. So this broken symmetry implies that there are three quarks, uh, three families of quarks. And, and the people behind those uh, CP violation experiment and the prediction of three families of quarks were awarded, uh, of course, their share of Nobel Prizes in 1980 and 2008. Now, this could be a tantalizing um, 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 example of, of, of trying to explain why the universe has more matter than antimatter. So the CP violation could provide a hint. And in fact, Andrei Sakharov in 67 explained some conditions that have to be met in order for uh, baryon generation to explain why there is more matter than antimatter today. So first of all, we need that the baryon number is violated in some processes. So this means that there is a way to create more matter than so baryons and antibaryons. Furthermore, it requires that the charge conjugation and CP symmetries be violated because otherwise you would have compensation between the processes and you would basically, whenever you produce a baryon over an antibaryon, you would have the reverse process capable of producing more antibaryons and baryons. And furthermore, a third condition was that the interactions of the early universe had to be out of thermal equilibrium. This means that basically you would not have the ability for antimatter and antimatter to annihilate and therefore balance out what's happening. So for example, this could happen in an early universe which was rapidly expanding and which would reduce the level of uh, uh, matter-antimatter annihilation. So the standard model processes were actually maybe sufficient or maybe not sufficient to account for the pre present barren asymmetry, the hints that are it's probably not sufficient, and this would mean new physics. So here we stand um, with a standard model that's beautiful but cannot explain some things. Um, but on the other end, we also have another big problem. So I told you there are three symmetries that explain the particles and the interactions. But what we also have is that even with these symmetries, we cannot actually explain why the weak bosons, namely the W and Z, have a mass. We can also not explain the mass of quark and leptons, but this is uh, another story for in a few minutes. So the reason is that uh, basically if we do a transformation, and for now you will indulge me a second, I will, I will use some mathematics. Imagine this A, which is basically uh, one of the, the bosons, and see how it transforms under a certain transformation. So basically A makes A prime, and then see the impact of what it is if we had in our equations, a mass term. So a mass term looks like a certain mass and then the interaction between those A's. And when you do the mathematics and the mathematics really don't matter here, what you come up with is that the product of mass for A's and the product of mass for A primes actually do not match. So this is a fundamental problem because this means that the mass 
equation terms that contain the mass would actually break the invariance. And, and this, of course, is catastrophic. So, so far, we have a beautiful model, but it cannot explain the mass of particles. So theorists thought a, lot, a, long, about, a long time about this. And in 1964, some theorists came up with what we call uh, electroweak symmetry breaking, and namely the Higgs mechanism. So what they postulated is saying, okay, what if there is another field, another particle that actually um, interacts with all this stuff and could actually give us the apparent feeling that something is there to give mass to the particle, but is not really a master. So imagine we have these three bosons of this SU2 group and this four, uh, U1 group boson. So there's this four bosons of the electroweak interaction. And then we have four Higgs uh, bosons. So it's a field with four particles that correspond to that field. So in a high symmetry, in a high energy state, the situation is symmetric and none of these particles has mass. But imagine now that for a second, you basically have a breaking of that symmetry. For some reason, when the universe cooled down, there is a choice and a preferred choice. And in the potential of that theory, basically you have at lower energy and a symmetry because now you're not at the center. And when you rotate this uh, picture around, you see differences. And this is actually what gives mass to the particles. Because what happens in this process is you have a combination of these electroweak components with the components of the Higgs field. And in a way, the W and Z bosons of the massless version eat up the particles from the Higgs field. And this way they become massive while actually the photon remains alone and is actually remaining massless. Now, what this postulates is that the electroweak vector bosons actually acquire mass and, and a longitudinal polarization through this process. And what it also tells us is that we are left with one particle that we should observe in nature, which is the Higgs boson, which has a mass because it's the only one of that field that didn't interact. Now, this picture is a bit of a simplification, but at least it helps you give an idea. So it is the fact that the symmetry may apparently be broken in our world at our temperatures that actually gives mass to the particles. And indeed, that particle, the Higgs boson, was observed in 2012, and the 2013 Nobel Prize was awarded to um, 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 uh, Angler and Higgs for uh, this um, um, theory prediction. Uh, you see on the bottom plot how the Higgs boson appears in, in our experiments, and I'll get to that in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but also what's important is that actually the Higgs boson behaves uh, in a very predicted way, which is that it actually is responsible for giving mass to the particles. You can see on this plot that the strength of the coupling of the Higgs, which is in the vertical axis, is directly tied to the mass of the particle to a great accuracy between what we measure and what the theoretical prediction is. Now, I could talk about the Higgs boson for a very long time. It's very exciting, but unfortunately, I don't have time. So if you're interested to know more, you can follow Hong Tao's video um, in, in this channel, uh, which he gave a couple of months back. And this is uh, also very uh, interesting. Now, the ugly part of the standard model, because I have to show it, is that if you show it in full, the standard model looks like this. This is, this is the equation of the standard model. And based on that, you can actually derive all the properties I, I just talked about. But it's quite very ugly. And in fact, very few people uh, like it in this form, uh, unless you're a programmer or a physicist that needs to put this in a computer to do calculations, you probably don't want to deal with that version. Uh, luckily, actually, there is a more beautiful version which encompasses all the ideas of symmetries. Of course, the, the mathematical notations become heavier, but at least it is and it appears more beautiful. And it even fits on a mug. It's so small that you can carry it with you and you can get a mug. Now, let me briefly explain how these terms actually correspond to the interactions we discussed. So first we have the terms that show the interaction between the force carriers, those bosons we talked about. Then we have the second term that actually shows how the quarks and leptons of, of our theory actually interact with the force carriers. And then the third component is how these fermions that we talked about, the leptons and the, and the quarks, actually acquire mass by interacting with the Higgs field. And this is the, the fundamental part. And then how the Higgs field operates among itself. So how, how it interacts with itself, how it operates. So it's also um, these four pieces that actually make up 
the, the explanation for, for the standard model. This little hg in the middle is simply to take into account the antiparticles, and that's why uh, it's written very uh, briefly. So um, all this beautiful theory is actually uh, very precise and allows us to do predictions, very, very high accuracy. Take this plot here, which shows the occurrence rates of various phenomena, and you see the names of the phenomena on the bottom, um, and you see that actually we compare the theory with various experiments um, during the LHC, run one, run two, so various times where Atlas collected data, and you see that the theory matches experiment over an impressive 15 orders of magnitude, and this is just just impressive. I mean, you have so much precision in the theory and experiments matching that precision. Now, how we actually manage to make those experiments will be the, the focus of my last few minutes. So we have accelerators and particle accelerators are, are great for this. They're actually helping us to uh, collide particles. So in the LHC, which is a, a, a particle accelerated near Geneva in Switzerland, and you see there the Geneva Lake and the, the Alp Mountains in the back and the Mont Blanc uh, is actually a, a tunnel that's uh, containing an accelerator, which is 27 kilometers long and roughly 100 meters below ground. And this one is actually colliding particles, uh, protons most of the time. And there are several experiments which look at what the outcome of these collisions is. One of these experiments, and there are four of them in total, but uh, let's talk about the one we work on, which is the ATLAS experiment. Um, so the ATLAS experiment is a cylindric symmetric exp uh, experiment, which is 46 meter long and 25 meter in diameter. It weighs 7,000 tons and it is located 100 meter below ground. Uh, the name ATLAS comes with T in ATLAS stands for toroid, which is this characteristic shape of the toroid magnets here we have, uh, which um, are used to um, as part of the detector. So um, the ATLAS detector is actually a collection of multiple detectors. And each of these detectors have the role of being able to detect different types of interactions. So in the center, we have a tracker, which shows charged particle tracks, such as the, the electron or the proton. Then you have what we call the calorimeters in, in this gray, uh, in this brown and blue, which actually collect all the particles that are produced and measures their energy. and then uh, finally, on the outside, we have a muon system, which actually detects muons. Um, what I didn't say, but is implied, is the muon is the particle of the second generation, which looks like the electron. Uh, but this one is produced, but when it's produced, it doesn't interact much with our ordinary matter, because if it's of another family, and only the weak interaction would allow it to interact with the rest. And this way, it basically uh, leaves the detector without being uh, collected, but you can still see a trace of it. That's why those muon detectors are important. Now, let me briefly give you an idea on how we manage to accommodate the theory and, and make our experiments. So first we start with this accelerator that actually makes us the collisions. Then we have our detector, which is responsible for collecting uh, the, the data. Uh, when we have this detector and accelerator running, we actually take snapshots 40 million times per second. We take an image like this one, and then we start looking at what is interesting. Now, we can't possibly store 40 million images per second. We don't have the bandwidth and the memory for this. So we have a very complex trigger system, which helps us select the items we want. I cannot go into details here, but Heather has a talk specifically dedicated on how we select events in Atlas. So once you have all these events together, you can also do something else, which is check your theory and its predictions. And this is, for example, one prediction of the standard model. You actually generate virtual events in, in memory of computers uh, with this theory prediction. You actually simulate how these particles would actually interact with a virtual copy of your detector. And then you're left with the ability to compare the data of your real detector to the data of your simulated detector. And this is a process called reconstruction, where from the hits in the detector, you manage to put together something to decide how big, uh, which direction a particle went or didn't go. And then uh, as you compare the two with data analysis, you're able to understand if your theory matches your data. So in this plot on the right, uh, you see that the data points are black is what we measure. What you see is the number of events that is certain prop that meet a certain property. Uh, this here is, is, I will not go into details, but it's a mass, let's say the very much the mass of the Higgs boson, in fact. And these are events where the Higgs boson decayed in four leptons. 
Now, the standard model also predicts other ways uh, where the uh, four leptons can be produced. And so the Higgs prediction is in blue and the red is actually the other standard model processes that can predict these uh, four leptons being produced. And you see there that you actually need both, both the Higgs and the other processes to actually predict the data, which shows that we have a pretty good understanding of our theory and how it matches data. And of course, every time we run experiments, we can update further and give feedback to the theory um, uh, once we have done measurements. Now that's not all. There are other interesting processes. Producing Higgs is fun and nice and interesting to study, but actually the Higgs is fundamental in another class of processes. So imagine you have the particles in your accelerator which collide, but in fact, before colliding, they actually don't interact, they emit two gauge bosons, which we also call vector bosons, and those then interact. As you see here, this blob actually explains a wide range of interactions that they can follow. Now, we have from theory considerations, uh, a good understanding of how the occurrence of this phenomenon should happen as a function of the collision energy. And in fact, as we take further components into account, we have the problem that if we only take here the red and the orange components, which correspond to only the weak bosons interacting among themselves, we actually have a prediction that the rate of occurrence actually grows to infinity as we increase the energy of the collisions. Even if we can take into account quantum mechanic effects as this interference, the solution is diverging. And so we even predict a higher, higher occurrence rate with a big collision energy. So it's only with the presence of the Higgs boson, this, this uh, greenish terms, that we actually manage to keep a physical meaning to this interaction, namely that as energy increases, we don't have an infinite production of that process. Now, in our detector, we have to look how vector boson scattering looks like. And this is something, for example, I'll show in the case of four W bosons. Uh, in the case of four W bosons, we basically see this kind of events in our detector. So this is namely two charged leptons, an electron and a muon that come from our W, and an energy imbalance, this is the arrow to the bottom, which is actually caused by the neutrinos that are produced when the W decays to an electron and a muon. We also have the remnants of the proton that actually are two forward particle jets that are actually not interacting, but still there in our event. And once we collect all these events, we do the same as with the Higgs, we have the signal we're after, so the production of two W bosons and their interaction through the electroweak force. Uh, we also have backgrounds where the same process can happen through the strong interaction, which is much more abundant, except in this uh, same sign case, but that's the peculiarity of the phenomenon. And then cases, for example, where the W and Z background put together. But then when we combine all these backgrounds, we notice that it matches quite well the data. And here we have selected a kinematic region where we have more signal and less background. In some cases, we cannot do this so well. For example, when looking at the interaction between two Z bosons and a W and a Z, where we have a less favorite ratio between the part with a strong interaction, which you see here in, 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 in green, which is much bigger than the red, and see here in yellow with respect to the white, we actually have to require to sophisticated machine learning techniques to actually observe this production. So we make heavy use of advanced analysis techniques to be able to look for very rare phenomena. Another phenomena that's worth studying is actually using uh, the accelerator and, and, and the proton accelerator as a scattering of light with light. So we try to understand if two light particles get close together, what happens? In fact, they can't really interact, but they can produce other particles meanwhile, and actually um, uh, out, the outcome can be two W bosons. And this is a very interesting phenomena. We kind of see this in our detector. Again, we see a muon and an electron, for example, in the decay of the W, but this is an interesting uh, thing to say because it looks like these particles come out of nowhere because the photon doesn't leave a trace um, of, of lots of particles uh, compared to, for example, other backgrounds of two protons that can produce two Ws, you basically look for a region where it is very little tracking activity and it looks like almost these um, uh, uh, Ws come out of nowhere and you isolate that region and then you try to see how many events you have and you compare again your theory to your background. So this is the bin on the left with, with zero. And then on the right, you have all the other control regions where you basically are checking that your theory 
and the backgrounds are matching what you observe in data. And you see that to be very much uh, the case. So this is quite interesting because it's a very rare process and it's a quite fun process to study. Now, uh, as I wrap up, the next frontier in uh, particle physics uh, for vector boson scattering is polarization. You might be familiar with polarization in your everyday life if you go to the beach or the sun in general and have polarized glasses. So uh, light actually has a transverse polarization along its direction of motion. So this means that the electromagnetic uh, waves are actually uh, uh, oscillating in certain directions transverse to the, to the uh, direction of motion. But if you take a polarizing filter and for example, polarized sunglasses are like that, you basically uh, get the polarization in only one direction. This will reduce a bit the intensity of light. And for example, the peculiarity is that if you take two polarized filters, which are orthogonal to each other, you can actually cancel out the light. Now, this is just a small analogy to explain polarization, but because photons are massless, they don't have a longitudinal polarization component. They only have transverse components. But if you remember what I told you a few minutes back when we're studying the Higgs mechanism, actually the W and Z bosons are massive and actually have a longitudinal polarization. And this they acquired during electroweak symmetry breaking. Now that's why it's important for us to study this because it is something fundamentally tied to the electroweak symmetry breaking and the Higgs mechanism. Now, unfortunately, longitudinal vector boson scattering is very rare and it's about five to 7% of our vector boson scattering collisions, but it's very sensitive to new physics. So in a couple of years, uh, we'll actually upgrade the Atlas detector and the accelerator to cope with more challenging luminosity conditions. For example, for processes like this one, the longitudinal polarization of vector boson scattering, we basically cannot hope to have the data, enough data to be able to observe this phenomenon. But if we increase the rate of collision or the luminosity in our high luminosity LHC, we actually will be able to observe these events. And here, for example, you have a picture of how the upgraded ATLAS tracker will see such an event at the high luminosity LHC. And for example, here you see an event with 200 simultaneous collisions, which comes from the fact that to reach a high luminosity, you need to do more collisions and they can happen at, uh, almost simultaneously. Uh, but uh, this is about two or three times more than what we have in the current LHC scenario. And this is actually extremely challenging for us. If you look at the blob on the left, it is actually quite a big mess to disentangle and sorry for the word. Now, luckily uh, this would allow us to get more data. And here you would be able to see a plot where you start having some view of longitudinal polarization in black with respect to the other backgrounds, including the transverse polarization modes of vector boson scattering in blue. So um, I hope I managed to show you a few things that we do in real life and how we manage to get uh, things um, done in electroweak physics. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain lots of things like new plans for future colliders or how we want to go future in the field. But one thing that I wanted to stress out and which is going to be abundantly clear is that we are only at the beginning of a road because even if the standard model is a very successful theory, there are many things that we don't understand quite yet and we have to provide and prepare new experiments to actually observe this further. What's sure is that probably symmetry will be a guiding principle of these things. And this will fall, allow us to, to come up with newer theories. There are people already looking out for new theories which respect principles of symmetry, uh, uh, but this is um, a fundamental thing in, in the quest for, for the almost maybe a final theory uh, for physics. Now, before I wrap up, I just want to make a little uh, nudge at a, at, a, at a TV show, which you probably all know, The Big Bang Theory, uh, where basically you see that um, you, you, you know, in this um, in this series, um, Sheldon and Amy um, uh, are two brilliant uh, people, one in physics and one in uh, neurobiology, um, and they actually, in that series, win the Nobel Prize. Uh, this was something the, the, the showmakers wanted to achieve, and the problem was that they had to find something came up uh, to come up with a plausible reason for them to get the Nobel Prize. So they have Professor Salzberg who was a science consultant on the show, was asked to come up with a way to justify their Nobel Prize. And what he came up with is actually uh, the idea that uh, our world is actually very symmetric, but 
uh, the theories around it are symmetric, but our world is a bit asymmetrical. So actually, what about making a theory, which in the show is called super asymmetry, which actually is slightly asymmetric, and this could beautifully explain the world around us. And so this was uh, a way for, in the show, explain how they managed to get the Nobel Prize for something that's not being worked on, because our theories are actually going for symmetry. Um, and uh, without further ado, I want to just show you one little sculpture of symmetry theory in the world, where you see that how uh, this is a sculpture at Fermilab, which is a CERN equivalent in, in the United States. Uh, it's near Chicago, where you see a sculpture installed by the first uh, director of Fermilab, um, uh, Robert Wilson. And this symmetry, uh, this sculpture is actually highly asymmetric. Whatever you look at it, you see that it's actually not, not quite symmetric. And in fact, there are only two points from which there is a full symmetry. This is if you are completely at the top or completely at the bottom. And so is our world, actually. The world appears symmetric in some cases, but in fact is mostly asymmetric. And this is uh, this little breakings in symmetry that make the world around us. So I want to thank you very much uh, for your attention. I was a bit longer. I, I got enthusiastic about explaining these things to you. I hope you enjoyed the time. And I hope we still have some time for a few questions. Great, thanks Carolus. Uh, yes, indeed, it's time for a question and answer session. Uh, thanks to all of you on YouTube and our social media channels who've been posting questions before and during the, uh, uh, the presentation. Um, you can still ask questions, there's still opportunities to do that. Uh, we may not be able to get to all of your questions, however, today, but uh, thank, thank you, everyone, for interacting. Um, so our first question today uh, for you, Carlos, is uh, where does antimatter get its mass from? So um, in, in, in the picture that I showed of the standard model, it's true that I focused uh, very much on the matter. But in fact, the interaction of the antimatter is uh, very similar to that of matter with uh, the Higgs field. So basically, uh, for the fermions, the, the same way the fermions get their mass, anti-fermions get exactly their mass from the same Higgs mechanism. Great, thanks. And um, could you tell us what are some of the current models uh, that explain the, uh, the apparent matter antimatter asymmetry that you mentioned in your talk? Uh, so there are uh, several models in uh, what we call baryogenesis, which try to explain why um, we need to have some asymmetry that I explained for uh, the, the, the apparent difference between uh, matter and antimatter. Uh, but uh, otherwise, we, we, we don't have the standard model capable of explaining this. And there are some theories that the theories, you know, try to explain why the matter and antimatter uh, numbers in the universe are asymmetric, but so far none of them has come with an experimental view and an experimental confirmation. So it's a very much open question in physics. Right now what we're trying to understand is whether how much the, the standard model is asymmetric, how much CP violation there is in the standard model, and once we will know that, uh, uh, we will have to open the question. But there are no brilliant theories that explain why we have more matter than antimatter. Thanks. And um, so another question was asking, why are the W and Z bosons named that way? Um, good, good question. Um, I don't remember, to be honest. Do you, maybe, Darren? I'm going to bring this back. So it, it is a good question. Um, I, I think probably the W, I'm guessing here, uh, the W bosons probably just associated with the weak force. And then probably the Z was just named, you know, relative to that rather than going for x and y but um it's a good question um, that's what would I, I would have thought too w for weak and and this is clear but for the z i have no idea but it's an interesting question i'm sure if you google it on the internet maybe there is the uh solution there but it's true that the names were less creative than the quarks uh, names for example yeah um okay so another question we have maybe z for zero for the charge I don't know. could be neutral particle yeah um, so another part, another question we have is, uh, can all particle masses or the masses of all of the particles be attributed to the Higgs mechanism or their possible exceptions? Um, so the Higgs mechanism uh, explains the mass of the gauge bosons through a fundamental way. 
uh, the mass of the um, in, of the fermions are coming uh, from the Higgs boson as well in a in a haddock way, but it looks like quite the right solution. Uh, the one particle that uh, is actually not really coupled to the Higgs at the moment is the neutrinos, and we know they have mass uh, because we observe oscillations of neutrinos. So this means that. For example, from the sun, when a neutrino is produced, it's an electron neutrino, and uh, the, the rate of electron neutrinos that arrive to Earth is not what we expect um, from, from calculations. So this means that basically some of the neutrinos of type electron were converted along the way to a type muon or a type tau, and this can only happen with mass, but the standard model does not provide a way to explain the mass of these neutrinos. So this is one of the most fundamental questions is we know that the neutrinos have mass. We don't know how small they are. We only know some differences between the masses, even actually worse. We only know the square of the difference. Um, and um, unfortunately, we don't have an explanation for that, but uh, this is um, something uh, worth for active research. Yeah, and um, so a final question for tonight. Um, what would you say you're most looking forward to uh, in the next phase of the LHC operation? Um, so obviously um, in the next phase of the LHC operation, uh, it would be gorgeous, of course, if we managed to have some new particle produced in abundance, but unfortunately this will not quite happen because the amount of energy that the LHC will have uh, versus the, the, the high luminosity LHC would um, not be that different. So we were not expecting something fundamentally new, but maybe actually there could be a chance because I'm gonna go back to something which was in the past. So when the lab collider, which was before the LHC in the same tunnel, I was looking for the Higgs boson. Actually, its energy was barely not enough to actually produce the Higgs boson. And if it had been slightly more powerful, it might have discovered the Higgs boson probably a decade before the LHC, but it was barely unlucky. So unless there is something like that where we're unlucky and we wouldn't know about it, right? It's not like the Higgs boson was, it was very much predicted, but here we don't know. Uh, maybe we're lucky and then something new comes out in abundance. So that would be very exciting. Uh, but on a more pragmatic note with the next phase of the LHC that's gonna turn on now, we hope to consolidate uh, the theories that we know and try to get more events out, understand our processes better, prepare our tools for the final phase of the luminosity, high luminosity LHC, where we hope to, for example, discover something like the Higgs self-interaction. So one thing that I didn't have time much to describe is that the Higgs can interact with itself. And the fact is that this self-interaction would provide a lot of insights on the form of the potential which the Higgs field abides by. And the form of the potential is actually very much tied to the stability of the universe. I cannot say more here because it's, it's a long process, but uh, it would be very exciting to know exactly more about the Higgs. And this will be possible in the next phase of the high luminosity LHC. I realize I transverted a bit the question because I I'm not sure it was about the high luminosity LHC, but I brought it a bit forward for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Carlos. Okay, so we have to wrap up there. So thanks again to Carlos for, for giving us this presentation and thanks for everyone uh, for joining us here on YouTube and on social media. Um, please do keep out an eye out for the, uh, the next live talk from Atlas and uh, thanks for joining us, bye. And if you will allow me just Darren, one little second is if you have questions, feel free to write them still in the chat and we can come back in the chat discussion after them. So, you know, no question will be left unanswered. So uh, please do so. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carlos. Bye. Bye, everyone.